It seems like the feds are playing nicely with the prairie premiers lately. The new natural resources minister, Seamus O'Regan, met recently with Sonia Savage, our province's energy minister. Canada's new deputy prime minister, Christian Freeland, met with Alberta premier Jason Kenney. To talk more about it is the Alberta correspondent with the National Post and our legislative reporter, Tyler Dawson. Tyler, are these little visits by key liberal ministers smoothing over the rough waters? Well, you know, it almost feels like it. It's it's very hard to know, I think, to what extent these overtures are going to trickle down into the wider community, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the wider province, um, and, you know, all the upset people out and about. But when Jason Kenney met with Christian Freeland, they were very friendly. He welcomed her quite warmly, said former Alberta girl, so on and so forth. Um, and then the statement that his office put out afterwards was relatively conciliatory. And the earlier before that, when Seamus O'Regan was here and meeting with Sonia Savage, the same sort of thing happened. She said she was hopeful and felt, you know, um, reassured by the fact that he'd listened to her concerns and things like that. So I, I and I think, you know, maybe this is just playing nice in political corridors and political, you know, maneuvering, because anything the Alberta government wants done on these issues, they do need the feds to do it. So, you know, it's a little bit hard to say, but. It, at least they weren't shouting at each other, I suppose. It, it did feel like maybe a page had been turned, at least in the politics of it. Now, if we want to hear the shouting, I guess we have to wait for Kenny and Notley to be back at the ledge again. But speaking of Kenny, is he kind of maybe chomping at the bit a little bit to chat Bill C-69 and C-48 with our new natural resources minister, Seamus O'Regan? Well, so that's the interesting thing. After he met with Krista Freeland this week, he, in his statement, he basically, he reiterated all the nice things that he'd said, but then added in, you know, we've actually sent in this list of demands to the federal government. And on those demands, among those demands, I should say, is the repeal of Bill C-69 and C-48. That's the tanker ban is the, uh, the latter, and the other one is the overhaul of sort of regulatory processes for industrial projects. Um, and there has been some murmurings here and there from federal politicians, and Mayor Nahid Nenshi of Calgary said this the other week, um, that there might be some changes in the implementation of it. Uh, no one really knows what that means at this point, I would say. Maybe it's a delay, maybe it's, um, you know, it'll, who knows. Um, so, you know, but this is a sign of some openness towards change and listening to the premiers of Alberta and Saskatchewan, I think, um, and... Regardless, I think that should be a little bit heartening. I, I can't imagine we're going to see a full repeal like Jason Kenney wants, but there there are murmurs of uh, understanding coming from the feds, which is maybe a bright side. Tyler, did Premier Kenney also bring up the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Um, so on that list of demands is they want a firm guarantee that the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is going to get built. Um, it's sort of weird how these issues come and go. I mean, we haven't talked about the carbon tax in weeks and weeks and weeks, and Kenny hasn't brought it up either. And the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is sort of a similar thing that's just sort of coasting along in the background right now. Um, maybe while everyone waits to see if things are going to keep going smoothly. So, no, it, it has not come up recently in any substantive way to my knowledge. So no news is good news, as they say. The CN Rail strike impacted our farmers and oil producers in a big way, Tyler. The tentative agreement reached is good news for all of Canada, really. Yeah, it was quite interesting. We talk a lot about, you know, these issues that affect sort of exclusively Western Canada, but this really was one of those things that came came along that really, you know, coast to coast, people move a lot of stuff by rail, which is, you know, maybe as they intended it 150 years ago. But uh, as you say, it really affected farmers in Ontario and Quebec. You would you would propane shipments mainly were delayed um, and they needed them to run their grain dryers and things like that. So lots of concern out East and in central Canada about that. And then, as you mentioned out here, you know, without pipeline access, all of our, uh, all of our oil is supposed to go by rail and, you know, agricultural products are trying to get to markets. So this, um, and you know, there were calls from the premier of Alberta and elsewhere to, get back to Ottawa, have legislators return and legislate the striking workers back to work, saying sort of this is an essential service. That did not happen. Um, there was lots of noise made about that, I would say. But, you know, it was a, as good a resolution in some ways to a labor dispute as one could hope for, I think. They, yeah, it's good that the union and CNRL were able to really find that tentative agreement on their own. 
Now, politicians in Quebec, like you mentioned, discussed the propane shortage in that province, how dire it was, especially for their hospitals. There was an Alberta firm that helped bail out Quebec by sending propane trains to the province? Yeah, that's right. There was. So the, the short version of it is Quebec runs a lot of sort of backups power and kitchen power and heating and things like that on propane hospitals and retirement homes as well. So and they use, you know, millions and millions of liters of propane every day. And they were running out sort of and had, you know, a reserve of I think it was about six million or 12 million liters. Um, so, they'd, you know, a handful of days in reserve and the funny thing, of course, is that the propane that they use mostly actually comes from Alberta, the pipeline that goes over to Sarnia, Ontario. And then from there, it either goes by truck or train, mostly by train. Um, but yes, it was an Alberta firm that sent in, you know, I, I'm blanking on the exact number now, but it was several days worth of propane. This was to bail out uh, the hospitals and essential services and agriculture and things like that until it was all smoothed over, citing Canadian patriotism as the reason for doing it. So, you know, at the end of the day, market-based based solutions and the labor situation seems to be resolving and maybe all's well that ends well, but but all the all the sort of financial reporting and business reporting over the past week or so suggests that we are going to see some ripple effects of this through GDP and through the economy for the next little while. Well, any backlogs that have built up sort of shake out. Recall legislation passed second reading, Tyler. If this passes, does this mean we can recall the legislator? How would that actually work? Yeah, so once it passes, that does seem to be the plan. So the, the basics of it are you will need to sign up. I think it's 50% of all electors in a riding. And you will need to do that within 60 days, I believe. Um, and then you will need to you know, present that to the legislature and say, look, we got all these people on board. We got them on board this quickly, and we don't like whoever it might be, um, and they would recall them. So there are, there are other jurisdictions that have tried these sort of things. Um, and it's been, you know, a conservative uh, proposal for a long time. So we will see how often, if ever, it gets used. I mean, I can think of a couple instances maybe when it would have in Alberta. Um, you know, there was some NDP controversies right at the beginning, for example, that people were quite worked up about. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things you always, you always wonder when politicians do these, if they worry that it'll backfire on them. I can't imagine Jason Kenney will get recalled, but that is exactly what this would allow for should, uh, should his riding members decide they don't like him very much. Now, a story we recently had on Bridge City News is how the province is launching a survey into whether or not we should keep daylight savings. Hmm. Now, what have you been hearing? Yeah. Most people I've spoken to here say what, they want to ditch it. They want to get rid of it. Well, isn't that odd? Because I don't mind it. I, I think it's it's worth the pain to get that extra hour of sunlight when 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 summer starts to come. So, no, you know, it's been all quiet on that front, actually. But it, it's, I shouldn't say all quiet. It's been quite quiet on that front. The government is consulting and doing its survey thing on that. Um, and at some point, we'll see what happens. So it's, there does seem to be a bit of a trend of other jurisdictions moving away from this stuff, too. So materially, I, I wonder how much it'll matter. Um, but if it's something that people want, it's an you know it's an easy win for the government. They've they've had been they've given themselves a rough sort of six weeks here with the budget and spending cuts, and it's not going to get any easier for them. So if they can find something that everyone agrees on, and if everyone dislikes daylight savings time, all of a sudden they've got a winner of a policy proposal coming into the new year. I think the Conscience Bill of Rights, Bill two hundred seven, looks like it may have died recently. Tyler, I think in committee was what the vote was eight two against. Yeah, and so the voting committee sort of it voted that they don't proceed with debating it. And so there's some sort of procedural wranglings that'll happen in the next little while that will either see it killed completely um, or but most likely it probably just dies on the order paper. They just don't have time to get back to it. Um, but yeah, this was the doctor conscience rights bill. This was the one where doctors wouldn't have to provide referrals for services they felt uh, morally did not align with their their moral views. So whether that was abortion or um, assisted suicide, things like that. The um, religious beliefs, really, right? Yeah. Yeah, religious beliefs, exactly. Um, and it was super controversial, you know, the NDP saying that this was a backdoor to abortion. Uh, and it was a private member's bill that I think often gets lost in this discussion. This was not a UCP bill that was not like the justice minister introduced this or something. It was a backbench bill. Um, and a lot of UCP members uh, refused to support it as well. So... You know, one of those one of those sort of social conservative bills that social conservatives in many places would support, but that uh, were quite controversial, 
given the NDP's sort of long-running attack, I think, on social conservatives in the UCP. So, and you know, there's a, I meant to mention there's a convention coming up this weekend, and um, historically that has been one of the places, a policy convention, where some social conservative ideas have sort of bubbled through in controversy. So this weekend in Calgary, uh, no doubt the UCP brass will be keeping a close eye on those things. Their AGM coming up, that's right. The provincial government is consulting again, but this time, Tyler, on photo radar, putting a hold on any new photo radar equipment. But hey, what about the current photo radar? Can we see it maybe being discontinued? That could be the outcome of this, I believe. So the, the, the big announcement this week was that there will be no new equipment purchases um, but it'll, it'll still be business as usual until basically they, they want to determine whether or not this is just a cash cow or whether or not there are, you know, legitimate safety um, reasons for having photo radar and whether or not municipalities can justify using them. So, you know, this is another one of those things that is perhaps an easy win for the government. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things that no government wants to ever have to put in place. And so to take it away, I think, is almost a guaranteed win for the UCP, certainly in, in some communities. So, but that study will go on and sort of get to the bottom of it. Um, and they, you know, the study, the other thing I think that's worth keeping in mind about a lot of these surveys and studies and things like that is it, it does allow the government some wiggle room. Um, instead of just making an immediate decision, they're saying, let's study it. We're going to have expert recommendations. Then we can think about it. So I think it gives them a lot of political wiggle room to say, oh, well, we maybe, maybe we would have liked this, but you know, the, our expert panel came back and said that this was not actually a great idea. So in, I think it's very savvy politicking in addition to, um, into maybe getting good evidence for their policy. Premier Jason Kenney was just in Texas recently pitching Alberta and what we can offer, right? I mean, they're one of our big trading partners here. So let me ask you something. When he came back to the ledge, did Rachel Notley welcome him back with open arms? Oh, he's had a rough ride of it. He's uh, He's been asked about it at every turn, about um, about the Bill 22 stuff, which was the, the canning of the election commissioner, Lauren Gibson. Um, no, it, it, is, it has been a rough week in question period for, for them, and they are feisty and back at it. Um, you know, the, the development from, I think when we last talked is that Rachel Notley did sort of apologize and is allowed back in the chamber now. So she, uh, she had used unparliamentary language, uh, referring to Jason Nixon last week. I think that would have been, so she, she had a little bit of a timeout outside of the legislature for, for a bit there, but she has made up and is back in the house and hounding Jason Kenney. You know, the, they were, she was going after him about the farm bill this week, for example, that uh, was announced last week. Um, they have concerns about the minimum wage rule changes that are in the bill. So the, it, it's fiery as always, and it looks like we've got about a week left, maybe more if things don't wrap up. Um, so there's some murmurs of that around the legislature, but uh, there's a lot of business to be done in the next week. And everyone's just as fired up as they were six months ago. I don't know how they all have the energy to do it. But I'm guessing there won't be too much of a, a Christmas card exchange between Kenny and Notley, right? Well, goodness, it's uh, we're having our Christmas party next week, so they all better buck up and become friends because we've got tickets to sell. <laughs> <laughs> the Alberta correspondent for the National Post and our legislative reporter, Tyler Dawson. Thanks for joining me from Edmonton. Thanks for having me, Hal. On behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Thanks for watching.